intent of Genesis to its original audience is actually compatible with an evolutionary stance. Now, I know that that's probably the most challenging bit of what we're going to ta talk about tonight, but be that as it may, that's what's out there. You may be familiar with, has anyone heard of Bruce Waltke? Bruce Waltke is a theologian. He's a former president of the Evangelical Theological Society. He was a professor at Regent College for a while. Uh, he's retired now. He's written a number of commentaries on Old Testament literature. He's an expert in the Proverbs. He's also recently released a very large book called An Old Testament Theology. It's a whopping great tome. In that, he has several chapters on Genesis, understanding Genesis in its original context for its original intended audience. Now, obviously, I don't have the time to go through all the lines of stuff that he talks about that because he obviously felt it took a couple of chapters and he's the expert. But you might be interested in his conclusion. And this is his conclusion at the end of that thoroughgoing work through in terms of what Genesis is on about. He says, the best harmonious synthesis of special revelation of the Bible and of general revelation of human nature, basically, we can understand God speaks to us through special revelation, through the scriptures, and through general revelation in terms of what we see in the, in the created world. And he says the best way to put these two things together is what he calls the theory of theistic evolution. Now, he doesn't really understand what theory really means, but the notion of theistic evolution. Theistic evolution is this notion that God ordained and sustained an evolutionary process as the natural mechanism by which he created humans. That's essentially in a nutshell. You've probably come up, if you're you interested, that it's that theistic evolution is the, under, is the notion that God chose and ordained and sustained an evolutionary process as the natural mechanism by which he created humans. So basically creation through an evolutionary process. Now, that might seem way beyond the pale, and I, I get that. I was there once. I was thoroughly an anti-evolutionary advocate all the way through my bachelor's and my PhD. I stood up and argued with my professors like others did. I did the whole bit. I've been there. And uh, what changed my mind? Well, I'm a geneticist and I'm a genomicist. And when in 2005 that research program that described the findings of the Human Genome Project compared to the Chimpanzee Genome Project, I sat down, I read that paper, I understood it fully. I remember putting it down on my desk and saying, well, that settles that then, now what do I do? But I knew, I had enough theological background at that point that I already knew that these ideas were out there, so I knew I wasn't gonna just sort of fall off a cliff somewhere and lose my faith. I knew that other people had been thinking along these lines. Okay, here's another one. Um, Roy Clauser is, um, a little bit of his bio there. The reason why I mention him is that he wrote a very nice chapter in this book called Is Theism, Theism Compatible with Evolution? I think he does a very even-handed job of addressing this from a Christian perspective. He's not a scientist, but he's like a philosopher, so it's a professor of philosophy and religion. So he's coming at it from the Genesis angle. And this chapter is well worth the read. I've actually brought a few copies of it, photocopied, and I also have it available as a PDF so that you can read it. And I think it would make an excellent, whatever one's take on the material tonight, I think it would make an excellent read. And okay, so to wrap up. Multiple different lines of genomic evidence converge on this hypothesis that humans and other forms of life share a common ancestry. Genomics evidence converges with multiple lines of evidence from other disciplines. Now, we've been very genomics focused tonight, but that's not the whole story when it comes to evolution or the evidence for evolution. There's also the original lines of evidence that we originally assign, uh, assembled those hierarchical relatedness trees on in comparative anatomy and physiology, so that still stands. We haven't talked about comparative embryology, but there's quite a bit there that would strongly suggest the same, and we haven't even scratched the surface of what we find in the fossil record. I mentioned that humans and chimpanzees are thought to be the most closely related living species, 
but there are numerous, numerous other species in the fossil record that seem to satisfy the criteria of other forms of life that are intermediate between what we see in modern humans and modern chimpanzees. So you're probably familiar with some of them. Um, even uh, Neanderthals would be one, or the different Australopithecines like Lucy and such. We haven't even scratched that surface yet, but those you would predict that those forms would be out there. And we haven't gone through all the different lines of evidence there, but that's there too, and we haven't found anything yet that would uh, take us away from this notion. Okay? Last point. Some theological <laughs> scholars, evangelical scholars, uh, Walt Key is a Hebrew scholar, they've looked at this from the Genesis side of the equation, from the, bio, uh, the Bible side of the equation, and some of them actually like Waltke isn't completely on board in terms of sort of the full meal deal of human evolution. He's just coming at it from the Genesis scholar side of things, as far as I can understand. And what he says on the Genesis side of things is, yeah, okay, you can't read, it's reading Genesis in its original intent and context does not mandate being anti-evolutionary. Even though he doesn't perhaps fully sign on to human evolution. Okay. And the main point of the whole evening, specifically as a response to what we saw in the Truth Project, is the notion that if, 